Chapter Twenty Eight of North and South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma Blythe. North and South by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell. Chapter Twenty Eight. Comfort in Sorrow. Through crossed ground and through thy spirit's life. Trials untold to sail with giant strength. Good cheer, good cheer. Soon ends the bitter strife, and thou shalt reign in peace with Christ at length. Coe's Garden. A sooth we feel too strong and real to need thee on that road. But woe being come, the soul is dumb that crieth not on God. Mrs. Browning. That afternoon she walked swiftly to the Higgins's house. Mary was looking out for her. With a half-distrustful face, Margaret smiled into her eyes to reassure her. They passed quickly through the house-place, upstairs and into the quiet presence of the dead. Then Margaret was glad that she had come. The face, often so weary with pain, so restless with troublous thoughts, had now the faint, soft smile of eternal rest upon it. The slow tears gathered into Margaret's eyes, but a deep calm entered into her soul, and that was death. It looked more peaceful than life. All beautiful scriptures came into her mind. They rest from their labors. The weary are at rest. He giveth his beloved sleep. Slowly, slowly, Margaret turned away from the bed. Mary was humbly sobbing in the background. They went downstairs without a word. Resting his hand upon the house-table, Nicholas Higgins stood in the midst of the floor, his great eyes startled open by the news he had heard, as it came along the court, from many busy tongues. His eyes were dry and fierce, studying the reality of her death, bringing himself to understand that her place should know her no more, for she had been sickly, dying so long, that he had persuaded himself she would not die, that she would pull through. Margaret felt as if she had no business to be in there, familiarly acquainting herself with the surroundings of death which he, the father, had only just learnt. There had been a pause of an instant on the steep, crooked stair, when she first saw him, but now she tried to steal past his abstracted gaze, and to leave him in the solemn circle of his household misery. Mary sat down on the first chair she came to, and throwing her apron over her head, began to cry. The noise appeared to rouse him. He took sudden hold of Margaret's arm, and held her till he could gather words to speak, seemed dry. They came up thick, and choked, and hoarse. Were you with her? Did you see her die? No, replied Margaret, standing still with the utmost patience. Now she found herself perceived. It was some time before he spoke again, but he kept his hold on her arm. All men must die, said he at last, with a strange sort of gravity, which first suggested to Margaret the idea that he had been drinking, not enough to intoxicate himself, but enough to make his thoughts bewildered. But she were younger than me. Still he pondered over the event, not looking at Margaret, though he grasped her tight. Suddenly he looked up at her with a wild, searching inquiry in his glance. You sure and certain she's dead? Not in a dwell? A faint? She's been so before, often. She is dead, replied Margaret. She felt no fear in speaking to him, though he hurt her arm with his grip, and wild gleams came across the stupidity of his eyes. She is dead, she said. He looked at her still, with that certain look, which seemed to fade out of his eyes as he gazed. Then he suddenly let go his hold of Margaret, and throwing his body half across the table, he shook it and every piece of furniture in the room, with his violent sobs. Mary came trembling towards him. "'Get thee gone, get thee gone,' he cried, striking wildly and blindly at her. "'What do I care for thee?' Margaret took her hand and held it softly in hers. He tore his hair. He beat his head against the hard wood. Then he lay exhausted and stupid. 
Still his daughter and Margaret did not move. Mary trembled from head to foot. At last, it might have been a quarter of an hour, it might have been an hour, he lifted himself up. His eyes were swollen and bloodshot, and he seemed to have forgotten that any one was by. He scowled at the watchers when he saw them. He shook himself heavily, gave them one more sullen look, spoke never a word, but made for the door. "'Oh, father, father,' said Mary, throwing herself upon his arm, "'not to-night, any night, but not to-night. "'Oh, help me, he's going out to drink again. "'Father, I'll not leave you. "'You may strike, but I'll not leave you. "'She told me last of all to keep you from drink.' But Margaret stood in the doorway, silent yet commanding. He looked up at her defyingly. It's my own house. Stand out of the way, wench, or I'll make you. He had shaken off Mary with violence. He looked ready to strike Margaret, but she never moved a feature, never took her deep, serious eyes off him. He stared back on her with gloomy fierceness. If she had stood hand or foot, he would have thrust her aside, with even more violence than he had used to his own daughter, whose face was bleeding from her fall against a chair. "'What are you looking at me in that way for?' asked he at last, daunted and awed by her severe calm. "'If you think for to keep me from going what gate I choose, because she loved you, and in my own house, too, where I never asked her to come, you're mistaken. It's very hard upon a man that he can't go to the only comfort left.' Margaret felt that he had acknowledged her power. What could she do next? He had seated himself on a chair, close to the door, half conquered, half resenting, intending to go out as soon as she left her position, but unwilling to use the violence he had threatened not five minutes before. Margaret laid her hand on his arm. Come with me, she said. Come and see her. The voice in which she spoke was very low and solemn but there was no fear or doubt expressed in it, either of him or of his compliance. He sullenly rose up. He stood, uncertain, with dogged irresolution upon his face. She waited him there, quietly and patiently waited for his time to move. He had a strange pleasure in making her wait, but at last he moved toward the stairs. She and he stood by the corpse. Her last words to Mary were, keep my father from drink. It cannot hurt her now, muttered he. Not can hurt her now. Then, raising his voice to a wail and cry, he went on. We may quarrel and fall out. We may make peace and be friends. We may clam to skin and bone, and not all our griefs will ever touch her more. Who's had her portion on em? What we hard work first, and sickness at last, Who's left the life of a dog, and to die without knowing one good piece of rejoicing in all it is? Nay, wench, whatever who said, who can know naught about it now? And I mum have a sup a drink just to steady me again, sorrow. No, said Margaret, softening with her softened manner. You shall not. If her life had been what you say, at any rate she did not fear death as some do. Oh, you should have heard her speak of the life to come, the life hidden with God, that she is now gone to. He shook his head, glancing sideways up at Margaret as he did so. His pale, haggard face struck her painfully. You are sorely tired. Where have you been all day? Not at work? Not at work, sure enough, he said with a short, grim laugh. Not at what you call work. I were at the committee till I was sickened out with trying to make fools hear reason. I were fetched to Boucher's wife before seven this morning. She's bed fast, but she went raving and raging to know where a dunder-headed brute of a chap was, as if I'd to keep him, as if he were fit to be ruled by me. That damned fool, he has put his foot in all our plans, and I've walked my feet sore with going about for to see men who wouldn't be seen. Now the law is raised again in us. And I was sore hearted too, which is worse than sore footed. And if I did see a friend who asked to treat me, I never knew who lay a dying here. Bayus, lass, thou'd lead me, thou wouldst, wouldst thou? 
turn to the poor dumb form with wild appeal. I am sure, said Margaret, I am sure you did not know. It was quite sudden. And now you see it would be different. You do know. You do see her lying there. You hear what she said with her last breath. You will not go? No answer. In fact, where was he to look for comfort? Come home with me, said she at last, with a bold venture, half trembling at her own proposal as she made it. At least you shall have some comfortable food, which I am sure you need. Your father's a parson, asked he, with a sudden turn in his ideas. He was, said Margaret shortly. I'll go and take a dish of tea with him, since you asked me. I've many a thing I often wish to say to a parson, and I'm not particular as to whether he's preaching now or not. Margaret was perplexed. His drinking tea with her father, who would be totally unprepared for his visitor, her mother so ill, seemed utterly out of the question, and yet if she drew back now it would be worse than ever, sure to drive him to the gin shop. She thought that if she could only get him to their own house, it was so great a step gained that she would trust to the chapter of accidents for the next. Goodbye, out, wench. We parted company at last, we have. But thou'st been a blessing to thy father ever since thou were born. Bless the white lips, lass. They have a smile on em now, and I'm glad to see it once again, though I'm lone and forlorn for evermore. He stooped down and fondly kissed his daughter, covered up her face, and turned to follow Margaret. She had hastily gone downstairs to tell Mary of the arrangement, to say it was the only way she could think of to keep him from the gin palace. To urge Mary to come, too, for her heart smote her at the idea of leaving the poor affectionate girl alone. But Mary had friends among the neighbors, she said, who would come in and sit a bit with her. It was all right. But father... He was there by them, as she would have spoken more. He had shaken off his emotion, as if he was ashamed of having ever given way to it, and had even overleaped himself so much that he assumed a sort of bitter mirth, like the crackling of thorns under a pot. I'm going to take my tea with her father, I am. But he slouched his cap low down over his brow as he went out into the street, and looked neither to the right nor to the left, while he tramped along by Margaret's side, he feared being upset by the words, still more, the looks, of sympathizing neighbors, so he and Margaret walked in silence. As he got near the street in which he knew she lived, he looked down at his clothes, his hands, and shoes. I should may happen at clean myself first. It certainly would have been desirable, but Margaret assured him he would be allowed to go into the yard and have soap and towel provided. She could not let him slip out of her hands just then. While he followed the house-servant along the passage and through the kitchen, stepping cautiously on every dark mark and the pattern of the oilcloth in order to conceal his dirty footprints, Margaret ran upstairs. She met Dixon on the landing. How's Mama? Where's Papa? Mrs. was tired and gone into her own room. She had wanted to go to bed. But Dixon had persuaded her to lie down on the sofa and have her tea brought to her there. It would have been better than getting restless by being too long in bed. So far, so good. But where was Mr. Hale? In the drawing-room. Margaret went in half breathless with the hurried story she had to tell. Of course, she told it incompletely, and her father was rather taken aback by the idea of the drunken weaver awaiting him in his quiet study with whom he was expected to drink tea, and on whose behalf Margaret was anxiously pleading. The meek, kind-hearted Mr. Hale would have readily tried to console him in his grief, but unluckily the point Margaret dwelt upon most forcibly was the fact of his having been drinking, and her having brought him home with her as the last expedient to keep him from the gin shop. One little event had come out of another so naturally, then Margaret was hardly conscious of what she had done, till she saw the slight look of repugnance on her father's face. Oh, Papa, he really is a man you will not dislike, if you won't be shocked to begin with. But, Margaret, to bring a drunken man home, and your mother so ill? Margaret's countenance fell. I am sorry, Papa. 
He is very quiet. He is not tipsy at all. He was only rather strange at first, but that might be the shock of poor Bessie's death. Margaret's eyes filled with tears. Mr. Hale took hold of her sweet, bleeding face in both his hands and kissed her forehead. It is all right, dear. I'll go and make him as comfortable as I can, and do you attend to your mother. Only, if you can come in and make a third in the study, I shall be glad. Oh, yes, thank you. And as Mr. Hale was leaving the room, she ran after him. Papa, you must not wonder at what he says. He ain't... I mean, he does not believe in much of what we do. Oh, dear, a drunken infidel weaver, said Mr. Hale to himself, in dismay. But to Margaret he only said, If your mother goes to sleep, be sure you come directly. Margaret went into her mother's room. Mrs. Hale lifted herself up from a doze. When did you write to Frederick, Margaret? Yesterday or the day before? Yesterday, Mama. Yesterday. And the letter went? Yes, I took it myself. Oh, Margaret, I'm so afraid of his coming. If he should be recognized, if he should be taken, if he should be executed after all these years, that he has kept away and lived in safety. I keep falling asleep and dreaming that he is caught and being tried. Oh, Mama, don't be afraid. There will be some risk, no doubt, but we will lessen it as much as ever we can. And it is so little. Now, if we were at Helston, there would be twenty, a hundred times as much. There everybody would remember him, and if there was a stranger known to be in the house, they would be sure to guess it was Frederick. While here, nobody knows or cares for us enough to notice what we do. Dixon will keep the door like a dragon. Won't you, Dixon, while he is here? They'll be clever if they come and pass me, said Dixon. "'showing her teeth at the bare idea. "'And he need not go out, except in the dusk, poor fellow.' "'Poor fellow,' echoed Mrs. Hale. "'But I almost wish you had not written. "'Would it be too late to stop him if you wrote again, Margaret?' "'I'm afraid it would, Mamma said Margaret, "'remembering the urgency with which she had entreated him to come directly, "'if he wished to see his mother alive.' I always dislike the doing things in such a hurry, said Mrs. Hale. Margaret was silent. Come now, ma'am, said Dixon, with a kind of cheerful authority. You know, seeing Master Frederick is just the very thing of all others you're longing for. And I'm glad Miss Margaret rode off straight without shilly shallying. I had a great mind to do it myself, but we'll keep him snug. Depend upon it. There's only Martha in the house. I would not do a good deal to save him, on a pinch, and I've been thinking she might go and see her mother just at that very time. She's been saying once or twice she should like to go, for her mother has had a stroke since she came here. Only she didn't like to ask, but I'll see about her being safe off, as soon as we know when he comes, God bless him. So take your tea, ma'am, in comfort, and trust to me. Mrs. Hale did trust in Dixon more than in Margaret. Dixon's words quieted her for the time. Margaret poured out the tea in silence, trying to think of something agreeable to say, but her thoughts made answers something like Daniel O'Rourke. When the man in the moon asked him to get off his reaping hook, the more you ask us, the more we won't stir, the more she tried to think of something, anything besides the danger to which Frederick would be exposed more closely her imagination clung to the unfortunate idea presented to her. Her mother prattled with Dixon, and seemed to have utterly forgotten the possibility of Frederick's being tried and executed, utterly forgotten that at her wish, if by Margaret's deed, he was summoned into this danger. Her mother was one of those who threw out terrible possibilities miserable probabilities, unfortunate chances of all kinds, as a rocket throws out sparks. But if the sparks light on some combustible matter, they smolder first, and burst out into a frightful flame at last. Margaret was glad, when her filial duties gently and carefully performed, she could go down into the study. She wondered how her father and Higgins had got on. In the first place, the decorous, kind-hearted, simple, old-fashioned gentleman had unconsciously called out, 
by his own refinement and courteousness of manner, all the latent courtesy in the other. Mr. Hale treated all his fellow creatures alike. It never entered into his head to make any difference because of their rank. He placed a chair for Nicholas, stood up till he, at Mr. Hale's request, took a seat, and called him, invariably, Mr. Higgins, instead of the cut Nicholas or Higgins, to which the drunken infidel weaver had been accustomed. But Nicholas was neither a habitual drunkard nor a thorough infidel. He drank to drown care, as he would have himself expressed it, and he was infidel so far as he had never found any form of faith to which he could attach himself, heart and soul. Margaret was a little surprised, and very much pleased, when she found her father and Higgins in earnest conversation, each speaking with gentle politeness to the other, however their opinions might clash. Nicholas, clean, tidied, if only at the pump trowel, and quiet spoken, was a new creature to her, who had only seen him in the rough independence of his own hearthstone. He had slicked his hair down with the fresh water, he had adjusted his neck handkerchief, and borrowed an odd candle end to polish his clogs with, and there he sat, enforcing some opinion on her father, with a strong Darkshire accent. It is true, but with a lowered voice, and a good earnest composure on his face. His father, too, was interested in what his companion was saying. He looked round as she came in, smiled, and quietly gave her his chair, and then sat down afresh as quickly as possible, and with a little bow of apology to his guest for the interruption. Higgins nodded to her as a sign of greeting, and she softly adjusted her working materials on the table, and prepared to listen. As I was saying, sir, I reckon you not have much belief in you if you lived here, if you've been bred here. I ask your pardon if I use wrong words, but what I mean by belief just now is a thinking on sayings and maxims and promises made by folks you never saw, about the things in the life you never saw, nor no one else. Now you say these things are true, and true sayings, and a true life. I just say, where's the proof? There's many a many a one wiser, and scores better learned than I am, around me. Folk who've had time to think on these things, while my time has had to be given up to be getting my bread. Well, I sees these people. Their lives is pretty much open to me. They're real folk. They don't believe in the Bible, not they. They may say they do, for form's sake. But, Lord, sir, do you think their first cry in the morning is, What shall I do to get hold on eternal life? Or what shall I do to fill my purse this blessed day? Where shall I go? What bargain shall I strike? The purse and the gold and the notes is real things. Things as can be felt and touched. Them's realities. And eternal life is all a talk. Very fit for. I ask your pardon, sir. You're a parson out of work, I believe. Well, I'll never speak disrespectful of a man in the same fix as I'm in myself. But I'll just ask you another question, sir, and I do not want you to answer it, only to put it in your pipe and smoke it, afore you go for to set down us, who only believe in what we see as fools and naughties. If salvation and life to come and what not was true, not in men's words, but in men's heart's core, don't you not think they din us with it, as they do with political economy? They're mighty anxious to come round us with that piece of wisdom. But the other would be a greater conversion, if it were true. But the masters have nothing to do with your religion. All that they are connected with you in is trade, so they think, and all that it concerns them, therefore, to rectify your opinions in, is the science of trade. I'm glad, sir, said Higgins, with a curious wink in his eye, that you put it, so they think. I'd have thought you a hypocrite, I feared, if you hadn't. For all you're a parson, or rather, because you're a parson. You see, if you'd spoken of religion as a thing that, if it was true, it didn't concern all men to press on all men's attention, above everything else in this parcel earth, I should have thought you're a knave for to be a parson. But I'd rather think you're a fool than a knave. No offense, I hope, sir. None at all. 
you consider me mistaken and i consider you far more fatally mistaken i don't expect to convince you in a day not in one conversation but let us know each other and speak freely to each other about these things and the truth will prevail i should not believe in god if i did not believe that mr higgins i trust whatever else you have given up you believe mr hale's voice dropped low in reverence you believe in him nicholas higgins suddenly stood straight stiff up margaret started to her feet for she thought by the working of his face he was going into convulsions mr hale looked at her dismayed at last higgins found words man i could fell you to the ground for tempting me what in business have you to try me with your doubts think of her lying there after the life who's led and think then how you deny me the only sole comfort left that there is a god and that he set her for life i don't know believe she'll ever live again said he sitting down and drearily going on as if to the unsympathizing fire i don't believe in any other life than this in which she dreamed such trouble and had such never-ending care and i cannot bear to think it were all a set of chances that might have been altered with a breath of wind there's many a time when i've thought i did not believe in god but i never put it fair out before me in words as many men do i may have laughed at those who did to brave it out like but i have looked round at after to see if he heard me if so be there was a he but to-day when i'm left desolate i will not listen to you with your questions and your doubts there's but one thing steady and quiet in all this real and world and reason or no reason i'll cling to that it's a very well for happy folk margaret touched his arm very softly she had not spoken before nor had he heard her rise nicholas we do not want to reason you misunderstand my father we do not reason we believe and so do you it is the one sole comfort in such times he turned round and caught her hand eh hey, it is it is brushing away the tears with the back of his hand but you know she's lying dead at home and i'm well eight days with sorrow and at times i hardly know what i'm saying it's as if speeches folk have made clever and smart things as i thought at the time come up now my heart's welly brozen the strikes failed as well don't you know that miss i was coming home to ask her like a beggar as i am for a bit of comfort in that trouble and i were knocked down by one who tell me she were dead just dead that were all but that were enough for me mr hale blew his nose and got up to snuff the candles in order to conceal his emotion he's not an infidel margaret how could you say so muttered he reproachfully i've a good mind to read in the fourteenth chapter of job not yet papa i think perhaps not at all let us ask him about the strike and give him all the sympathy he needs and hope to have from poor bessie so they questioned and listened the workmen's calculations were based like too many of the masters on false premises they reckoned on their fellow men as if they possessed the calculable powers of machines no more no less no allowance for human passions getting the better of reason as in the case of boucher and the riotous and believing that the representations of their injuries would have the same effect on strangers far away as the injuries fancied or real had upon themselves they were consequently surprised and indignant at the poor irish who had allowed themselves to be imported and brought over to take their places this indignation was tempered in some degree by contempt for them irishers and by pleasure at the idea of the bungling way in which they would set to work and perplex their new masters with their ignorance and stupidity strange exaggerated stories of which were already spreading through the town but the most cruel cut of all was that of the milton workmen who had defied and disobeyed the commands of the union to keep the peace whatever came who had originated discord in the camp and spread the panic of the law being arrayed against them 
"'And so the strike is at an end,' said Margaret. "'Eh, hey, miss, it's safe as safe can. "'The factor doors will need open wide tomorrow "'to let in all who be asking for work, "'if it's only just to show they'd not to do with a measure, "'which if we've been made of the right stuff, "'would have brought wages up to a point "'they'd not been at this ten year. "'You'll get work, shan't you?' asked Margaret. "'You're a famous workman, are you not?' Hamperin let me work at his mill, but he cuts off his right hand, not before and not after, said Nicholas quietly. Margaret was silenced and sad. About the wages, said Mr. Hale. You'll not be offended, but I think you made some sad mistakes. I should like to read you some remarks in a book I have. He got up and went to his bookshelves. You needn't trouble yourself, sir, said Nicholas. They're book stuff goes in one ear and out of the other. I can make naught on it. Before Hamper and me had the split, the overlooker told him I was stirring up the men to ask for higher wages, and Hamper met me one day in the yard. He'd a thin book in his hand, and says he, Higgins, I'm told you're one of those damn fools that think you can get higher wages for asking for them, and keep em up too when you're forced em up. Now I'll give you a chance, and try if you've any sense in you. Here's a book written by a friend of mine, and if you'll read it, you'll see how wages find their own level, without either masters or men having aught to do with them, except the men cut their own throats with striking, like the confounded noodles that are. Well, now, sir, I put it to you, being a parson, and having been in the preaching line, and haven't had to try and bring folk over to what you thought was a right way of thinking. Did you begin by calling em fools and such like? Or didn't you rather give em some kind of words at first, to make em ready for to listen and to be convinced, if they could? And in your preaching, did you stop every now and then and say half to them and half to yourself? But just such a pack of fools that I've a strong notion it's no use my trying to put sense into you. I were not in the best state, I'll own, for taking in what Hamper's friend had to say. I was so vexed at the way it were put to me, but I thought, come, I'll see what these chaps has got to say, and try if it's them or me as is the noodle. So I took the book and tugged at it, but, Lord bless you, it went on about capital and labor and labor and capital till it fair sent me off to sleep. I never could write the fix in my mind which was which, and it spoke on em as if they were vultures and vices. And what I wanted to know were the rights of men, whether they were rich or poor, so be they only were men. But for all that, said Mr. Hale, and granting to the full the offensiveness, the folly, the unchristianness of Mr. Hamper's way of speaking to you and recommending his friend's book, Yet if it told you what he said it did, that wages find their own level, and that the most successful strike can only force them up for a moment to sink in far greater proportion afterwards in consequence of that very strike, the book would have told you the truth. Well, sir, said Higgins rather doggedly, it might, or it might not. There's two opinions go to settle in that point. But suppose it was truth double strong. It were no truth to me if I couldn't take it in. I dare say there's truth in yon Latin book on your shelves, but it's gibberish and not truth to me, unless I know the meaning of the words. If you, sir, or any other knowledgeable patient man come to me and says he'll learn me what the words mean and not blow me up if I'm a bit stupid, or forget how one thing hangs on another, why, in time I may get to see the truth of it, or I may not. I'll not be bound to say I shall end in thinking the same as any man, and I'm not one who think truth can be shaped out of words, all neat and clean, as the men at the foundry cut out sheet iron. Same bones won't go down with every one. It'll stick here in this man's throat, and there in the other's. Let alone that, when down, it may be too strong for this one, too weak for that. Folk who sets up to doctor the world with their truth, and suit different for different minds, and be a bit tender in the way of giving it to, or the poor sick fools may spit it out in their faces. 
Now Hamba first gives me a box on my ear, and then he throws his big bullets at me, and says he reckons it'll do me no good. I'm such a fool. But there it is. I wish some of the kindest and wisest of the masters would meet some of you men, and have a good talk on these things. It would surely be the best way of getting over your difficulties, which I do believe arise from your ignorance. Excuse me, Mr. Higgins, on subjects which it is for the mutual interest of both masters and men should be well understood by both. I wonder, half to his daughter, if Mr. Thornton might not be induced to do such a thing. Remember, Papa, she said in a very low voice, what he said one day about governments, you know. She was unwilling to make any clear allusion to the conversation they had held on the mode of governing work people, by giving men intelligence enough to rule themselves, or by a wise despotism on the part of the masters, for she saw that Higgins had caught Mr. Thornton's name, if not the whole of the speech. Indeed, he began to speak of him. Thornton? He's the chap as rode off as one for those Irishers and led it to the riot that ruined the strike. Even Hampton, with all his bullying, would have waited a while, but it's a word and a blow with Thornton. And now, when the Union would have thanked him for following up the chase after Boucher, and then chaps as went right against our commands, it's Thornton who steps forward and coolly says that, as the strike's at an end, he, is party injured, doesn't want to press the charge against the rioters. I thought he'd had more pluck. I thought he'd have carried his point and had his revenge in an open way. But, says he, one in court tells me his very words. They are well known. They will find the natural punishment of their conduct in the difficulty they will meet with in getting employment. That would be severe enough. I only wish they'd caught Boucher and had him up before Hamper. I see that old Tucker sitting on him. Would he have let him off? Not he. Mr. Thornton was right, said Margaret. You are angry against Boucher, Nicholas, or else you would be the first to see that when the natural punishment would be severe enough for the offense, any farther punishment would be something like revenge. My daughter is no great friend of Mr. Thornton, said Mr. Hale, smiling at Margaret, while she, as red as any carnation, began to work with double diligence. But I believe what she says is the truth. I like him for it. Well, sir, this strike has been a weary piece of business to me, and you'll not wonder if I'm a bit put out with seeing it fail, just for a few men who would nest suffer in silence, and how it out, brave and firm. You forget, said Margaret. I don't know much about you, but the only time I saw him, it was not his own sufferings he spoke of, but those of his sick wife, his little children. True. But he were not made of awe on himself. He'd have cried out for his own sorrows next. He were not one to bear. How came he into the Union? asked Margaret innocently. You don't seem to have much respect for him, nor gain much good from having him in. Higgins' brow clouded. He was silent for a minute or two. Then he said, shortly enough, It's not for me to speak of the Union. What they does, they does. Then that is of a trade might hang together. And if they're not willing to take their chance along with the rest, the Union has ways and means. Mr. Hale saw that Higgins was vexed at the turn the conversation had taken, and was silent. Not so Margaret, though she saw Higgins feeling as clearly as he did. By instinct she felt that if he could be brought to express himself in plain words, Something clear would be gained on which to argue for the right and the just. And what are the Union's ways and means? He looked up at her, as if on the point of dogged resistance to her wish for information. But her calm face, fixed on his, patient and trustful, compelled him to answer. Well, if a man doesn't belong to the Union, then his work's next looms has orders not to speak to him. If he's sorry or ill, it's all the same. He's out of bounds. He's none of us. He comes among us. He works among us. But he's none of us. In some places, them's fine to speak to him. You try that, miss. Try living a year or two among them as looks away if you look at em. 
try working within two yards at crowds of men who you know have a grind and grudge at you in their hearts to whom if you say you're glad not an eye brightens nor a lip moves to whom if your heart's heavy you can never say naught because they'll never take notice on your sighs or sad looks and a man's no man who'll groan out loud about folk asking him what's the matter just you try that miss ten hours for three hundred days and you'll know a bit what the union is why wow, said margaret what tyranny this is nay higgins i don't care one straw for your anger i know you can't be angry with me if you would and i must tell you the truth that i never read in all the history i have read of a more slow lingering torture than this and you belong to the union and you talk of the tyranny of the masters nay said higgins you may say what you like the dead stand between you and every angry word of mine do you think i forgot who's lying there and how who loved you and it's the masters as has made us sin if the union is a sin not this generation maybe but the fathers their fathers ground our fathers to the very dust ground us to powder parson i reckon i've heard my mother read out a text the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge it's so with them in those days of sore oppression the unions began it were a necessity it's a necessity now according to me it's a withstanding of injustice past present or to come it may be like war along with it come crimes but I think it were a greater crime to let it alone. Our only chance is binding men together in one common interest, and if some are cowards and some are fools, they might come along and join the great march, whose only strength is in numbers. Oh, said Mr. Hale, sign, your union in itself would be beautiful, glorious. It would be Christianity itself, if it were but for an end which affected the good of all instead of that of merely one class as opposed to another i reckon it's time for me to be going sir said higgins as the clock struck ten home said margaret very softly he understood her and took her off at hand home miss you may trust me though i am one of the union i do trust you most thoroughly nicholas stay said mr hale hurrying to the bookshelves mr higgins i'm sure you'll join us in family prayer Higgins looked at Margaret, doubtfully. Her grave, sweet eyes met his. There was no compulsion, only deep interest in them. He did not speak, but he kept his place. Margaret the churchwoman, her father the dissenter, Higgins the infidel, knelt down together. It did them no harm. End of chapter 28 Recorded by Gemma Blath